Hey, welcome back to another chapter. This is chapter two. Cao Kung has the note. He who wishes to fight must first count the cost. Which prepares us for the discovery that the subject of this chapter is not what we might expect from the title, but is primarily a consideration of ways and means. Sun Tzu said, in the operations of war, where there are in the field a thousand swift chariots, as many heavy chariots, and a hundred thousand mail-clad soldiers, the swift chariots were lightly built and according to Chang Yu used for the attack but the heavy chariots were heavier and designed for purposes of defense Li Chuan it is true says that the latter were light but it seems hardly probable it is Interesting to note the analogies between early Chinese warfare and that of the Homeric Greeks. In each case, the war chariot was the important factor, forming, as it did, the nucleus round which was grouped a certain number of foot soldiers. With regard to the numbers given here, we are informed that each swift chariot was accompanied by 75 footmen, and each chariot by 25 footmen, so that the whole army would be divided up into a thousand battalions, each consisting of two chariots and a hundred men, with provisions enough to carry them a thousand Modern Li goes to a mile. The length may have varied slightly since Sun Tzu's time. The expenditure at home and at the front, including entertainment of guests, small items such as glue and paint and sums spent on chariots and armour, will reach the total of a thousand ounces of silver per day such is the cost of raising an army of 100,000 men. 2. When you engage in actual fighting, if victory is long in coming, the men's weapons will grow dull, and their ardour will be dampened. If you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. 3. Again, if the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not equal to the strain. 4. Now, when your weapons are dull, your ardour dampened, your strength exhausted, and your treasure spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity. Then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must end. Sure. 5. Thus, though we have heard of stupid haste in war, cleverness has never been associated with long delays. This concise and difficult sentence is not well explained by any of the commentators, Cao Kung, Li Chuan, Meng Shi, Chu Yu, Chu Mu, and Mei Yao Chen have notes to the effect that a general, though naturally stupid, may nevertheless conquer through sheer force of rapidity. Ho Shi says, haste may be stupid, but at any rate it saves expenditure of energy and treasure. Protracted operations may be very clever, but they bring calamity in their train. Wei 
Sway evades the difficulty of remarking, Lengthy operations mean an army growing old, wealth being expended, an empty exchequer, and distress among the people. True cleverness ensures against the occurrence of such calamities. Chang Yu says, so long as victory can be attained, stupid haste is preferable to clever dilatoriness. Now, Sun Tzu says nothing whatever except possibly by implication about the ill-considered haste being better than ingenious but lengthy operations. What he does say is something that's a little bit more guarded, namely that while speed may sometimes be injudicious, if only because it means impoverishment to the nation, in considering the point raised here by Sun Tzu, the classic example of Fabius Cunctator will inevitably occur to the mind. That general deliberately measured the endurance of Rome against that of Hannibal's isolated army, because it seemed to him that the latter was more likely to suffer from a long campaign in a strange country. But it is quite a moot question whether his tactics would have proved successful in the long run. Their reversal, it is true, led to Canet, but this only establishes negative presumption in their favour. Six. There is no instant of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. Seven. It is only one who is thoroughly acquainted with the evils of war that can thoroughly understand the profitable way of carrying it on. That is, with rapidity, only one who knows the disastrous effects of a long war can realize the supreme importance of rapidity in bringing it to a close. Only two commentators seem to favour this interpretation, but it fits well into the logic of the context, whereas the rendering, he who does not know the evils of war cannot appreciate its benefits, is distinctly pointless. Eight. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy, neither are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. Once war is declared, he will not waste precious time in waiting for reinforcements, nor will he return his army back for fresh supplies, but crosses the enemy's frontier without delay. This may seem an audacious policy to recommend, but with all great strategists, from Julius Caesar to Napoleon Bonaparte, the value of your time, that is, being a little ahead of your opponent, has counted for more than either numerical superiority or the nicest calculations with regard to commissariat. 9. Bring war material with you from home, but forage on the enemy. Thus the army will have food enough to its needs. The Chinese word translated here as war material literally means things to be used, and is meant in the widest sense. It includes all the impediments of an army, apart from provisions. 10. Poverty of the state, exchequer causes an army to be maintained by contributions from a distance. Contributing to maintain an army at a distance causes the people to be impoverished. The beginning of this sentence does not balance properly with the next, though obviously intended to do so. The arrangement, moreover, 
It's so awkward that I cannot help suspecting some corruption in the text. It never seems to occur to Chinese commentators that an emendation may be necessary for the sense, and we get no help from them there. The Chinese words Sun Tzu used indicate the cause of the people's impoverishment clearly have reference to some system by which the husbandmen send their contributions of corn to the army direct. But why should it fall on them to maintain an army in this way except because the state government is too poor to do so? Eleven. On the other hand, the proximity of an army causes prices to go up and high prices cause the people's substance to be drained away. Wang Si says high prices occur before the army has left its own territory. Cao Kung understands it of an army that has already crossed the frontier. Twelve. When their substance is drained away, the peasantry will be inflicted by heavy exactions. 13 and 14. With this loss of substance and exhaustion of strength, the homes of the people will be stripped bare and three-tenths of their income will be dissipated. Chu Mu and Wang Sui agree that the people are not Molted not of three out of ten, but out of seven out of ten of their income. But this is hardly to be extracted from our text. Hoshi has a characteristic tag. The people being regarded as the essential part of the state and food as the people's heaven. Is it not right that those in authority should value and be careful of both, while government expenses for broken chariots, worn-out horses, breastplates and helmets, bows and arrows, spears and shields, protective mantles, draught oxen, and heavy wagons will amount to four-tenths of its total revenue. Fifteen. Hence a wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cartload of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to twenty of one's own, and likewise a single pickle of his providers is equivalent to twenty from one's own. This is because twenty cartloads will be consumed in the process of transporting one cartload to the front. A pickle is a unit of measurement equal to 133.3 pounds, which is 65.5 kilograms. 16. Now, in order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger. That there may be advantage from defeating the enemy, they must have their rewards. Chumu says rewards are necessary in order to make the soldiers see the advantage of beating the enemy. Thus, when you capture spoils from the enemy, they must be used as rewards, so that all your men may have a keen desire to fight each on his account. 17. Therefore, in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. 18. This is called using the conquered foe to augment one's own strength. 19. 
In war, then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. As Ho Shi remarks, war is not a thing to be trifled with. Sun Tzu here reiterates the main lesson which the chapter is intended to enforce. 20. Thus it may be known that the leader of armies is the arbiter of the people's fate, the man on whom it depends whether the nation shall be in peace or in peril. And that's the end of the second chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching another video. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope that you got to relax. I hope that you had a reprieve, and good night.